1999, when I first got interested in the topic of obesity, I had read this article about the expanding size of the American population and all these catastrophic health consequences that were going to come from the fact that we were too fat. And I thought, wow, this would be a great book topic. And I like, Here's a big problem, here's a big health issue, and nobody had really written anything about it. And a funny thing happened along the way. The more research I started doing into the science behind obesity, because one of the first things I wanted to establish was that, in fact, being fat was going to be this big health consequence that everybody claimed it was going to be. And when I started looking at the scientific evidence on this, I found that, in fact, there wasn't very good scientific evidence at all behind this, that most of this was based on a lot of assumptions about fat and health or correlations between body size and morbidity and mortality. But in terms of being a causal factor, that saying being too heavy caused people to die earlier, caused people to have all these diseases, there just really wasn't any scientific evidence there. And then a very interesting thing came along and it occurred to me, it was like, well, if the scientific evidence was so unclear, then why are all these government health agencies, these public health advocates, these various drug companies saying that there's this big obesity epidemic? Why is there so much concern with our growing weight? The relationship between BMI and mortality uh, is a U-shaped relationship. What we typically find is that people with the shortest lifespans tend to be at the ends of the BMI spectrum, i.e. people with the lowest body weights and people with the highest body weights. What we don't really know is why that's the case. In fact, one could argue, based on recent data, that there are more people who die from weighing too little than do from weighing too much. But this shows that, for example, how we choose to look at the statistics and how we choose to look at the figures are fueled a lot more by our cultural prejudices and by framing that's done by the diet industry and the pharmaceutical industry than, in fact, I think the scientific facts behind body weight, mortality, and morbidity. One of the funniest things that I found when writing this book is that I'd be at dinner parties or I'd be at social functions, and I'd tell people, oh, I'm writing a book about obesity. And invariably, these would be thin people, they would say, oh, I can't believe how fat people are. Oh, they're gross. I can't believe they, people, someone would let themselves get that way. And it was very interesting because I hadn't told them the type of book that I was writing. It was more just this unsolicited invective against fat people. And I was very curious, why do people have so much contempt for fat people in our society? And it's very curious because in most of the world and throughout most of human history, fatness has been celebrated. I mean, if you had enough resources or you didn't have to be pulling a plow or hoeing a field, you were someone to be envied if you were heavy. It was a sign of your affluence and status. And around the beginning of the 20th century, when American food supplies increased dramatically with the industrialization of food production and food became much more widely available, the, so the social cachet of fatness began to change. And what you saw happening is that the American middle class and the American upper classes being, began to, embracing th to embrace thinness as an idea of a body status that you wanted to have. And I think a lot of this had to do with a particular class, middle class apprehension with body control, with a sense of I'm in charge of my own destiny, with a sense of I don't need to eat in a way, that I'm above sort of these sort of typical bodily desires or needs. Given our cultural history in this country, there's always been this great apprehension and anxiety about desires and appetites. Uh, you can think of, for example, the prohibition movements and, and all of these, uh, sort of this long moral history in this country, uh, a fear of desire and appetite. And so when we hear, for example, that our weights are growing and that obesity on the, on the rise, it stokes up a lot of anxiety for most people because it seems to seem that we have a lack of self-control. In fact, one of the ironies of the obesity epidemic is that because a lot of heavy people don't like to go to doctors because they're often treated very poorly by doctors, they're less likely to have a lot of other medical conditions not diagnosed at all. And so they end up having more chronic health problems or death from a variety of diseases, largely because they're not getting those diseases treated in the first place because of how poorly they're treated by doctors. If, in fact, they didn't face such prejudice and discrimination from their doctors, they might get earlier checkups and treatments for these conditions. And in fact, they might not be dying from these various conditions that then get attributed to their weight. The scientific evidence is unambiguous that exercise is incredibly important for your health. In fact, exercise is much more important for your health than body weight. If you take, a, 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 say, somebody who's 240 pounds and active and fit, as opposed to somebody who's 190 pounds and not active and not fit, the 240-pound person is going to be much, much healthier. 
If we think about most diseases that are attributable to obesity, take for example heart disease. Most people think that, oh, one of the big problems with being too fat is that it puts all, puts all this pressure on your heart and on your heart's arteries and it clogs your heart's arteries and it causes heart disease and death. In fact, there's almost no evidence whatsoever linking body weight with uh, heart, your heart arteries. Uh, and in fact, um, there are some clinical pathologists here who have done autopsies on obese corpse and finds that, you know, their hearts are perfectly fine. They're just like the hearts of people at normal range rates. Uh, and so there's this big misconception, for example, that somehow or another weight is causing heart disease. We don't really have any clear evidence that weight itself is a causal factor, that excess fatty tissue causes excess strain on the heart. We have to think about our, our body metabolism is one of our core functions for our survival. It basically keeps us alive. And it's a very resilient system, and it's a very redundant system. So this is why it's so difficult for most people to lose weight, because you're trying to tamper with one of our core regulatory mechanisms for our survival here. And so you might try suppressing appetite, but to do that you need very strong medications to do that, and the body might compensate in other ways. And so, for example, if you suddenly lower our caloric intake and you lower the amount of food that you're taking in at any given moment, your body suddenly thinks it's in conditions of starvation and it goes into survival mode, i.e. it's going to retain all the calories that it can. It's going, to, it's going to try to slow your metabolism down, slow your activity level down until your next food source is going to be coming along. And so that's why so many people when they diet they feel, feel irritable, they feel sluggish, they get depressed. It's their body's way of protecting itself. Now over the long haul what seems to happen is that if you start really changing your regulation of calories over time, your body starts to come to cope with this and your, your weight range and your natural weight range might shift as a result of that I, in a way that probably most people wouldn't want, i.e. if your body thinks that it's starving all the time and doesn't think that it's ever going to be ca uh, getting more calories in, it's going to be very fierce about defending whatever calories it keeps and it's going to have a lot of caloric retention. And so if you go back to then having a regular, uh, regular meal, say after you've had your dieting regime, your, your body might be sort of retaining more of those calories probably over time. The whole, my whole argument in my book is that we are focusing on a symptom of a problem and not on a problem itself. Should the government be doing something about obesity? Well, given the fact that I don't think obesity is the problem that most government agencies seem to claim that it is, then my suggestion is that anything that the government will try to do towards obesity is probably likely to cause more harm than good. Given the fact that we do not have a safe or effective mechanism for most Americans to lose weight, telling most Americans that they need to be thin in order to be healthy, irrespective of how they get thin, I think sends a very dangerous message and encourages people to engage in crash diets, to adopt dangerous procedures like bariatric surgery, to take dangerous diet pills or, or diet drugs, often, which oftentimes have very onerous side effects. That all of these factors may actually be causing more harm than good by telling people thin equals health.